Like when we sing together like that, I, I reckon heaven gets on board and the angels are singing with us. And uh, it's beautiful to have a, a little snapshot of heaven amongst us as we worship God. It's good, isn't it? And um, listen, if you're new to our church, uh, we make no apology for the fact that we love to praise Jesus. And it's okay to have a little bit of fun in our daddy's house as well. And it's, uh, it's really, really, really okay to press into the things of God in worship. And um, so, um, have you noticed that the congregation is half the size of last week? Have you noticed? Who was the preacher last week? Oh, oh no. He went on a bit, didn't he? <laughs> That'll be me. That'll be me. And um, I, I, I was so excited to share the message last week. I really was. And um, I get really excited. You're like, you know when you're reading your Bible and sometimes it's just like, I don't know, it's like the whole scripture you're reading is just like a cold drink on a hot day. And you're like, oh God, that is so good for my soul. I can't wait to share it with people. And um, so last week we started to look at what the heck did the disciples do um, after Jesus had ascended to heaven and when the Holy Spirit had come in power on the day of Pentecost, what did they do themselves afterwards? Well, the scripture is really good to us because it tells us. It says that the disciples, they, um, they, they devoted themselves to the who's teaching? The apostles' teaching. Sorry, to the who's teaching? Come on now, I'm a teacher. You don't get away with silence in my messages. All right. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, what were the apostles' teaching? Well, they'd been commissioned by Jesus to teach everybody else everything that he had commanded. So we can be confident that the apostles were teaching and preaching what Jesus had commanded. What was Jesus preaching and teaching? He was preaching, love God with all your heart, mind and soul and love your neighbour as yourself. And through that lens, he opened the, the Old Testament so that we could enter into the prophecies and the mystery and the ancient message, which is the story of God, the story of redemption of humanity. Isn't that good? And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking bread and to prayers. Well, we started to look at the teaching of an apostle last week, the Apostle Paul. Were you here last week? And as we were looking at the Apostle Paul's teaching, we dived into a letter that he wrote while he was under house arrest in Rome to a church in the city of Philippi that he had started 10 years previously. And the Apostle Paul, he was so excited to write to them. Though he was in prison, prison wasn't going to keep him down. Do you remember what happened to the Apostle Paul when he was in prison in Philippi? Do you remember that midnight praise party when suddenly an earthquake came and the chains fell off, fell off and, the, and the prison doors were shook open? Do you remember? Paul's not so concerned about prison because he knows that even prison cells can become a platform for the power of God to move. Hello? Oh, we were so encouraged last week. We loved reading about how the church in Philippi started in a lady's house. Can anybody remember her name? Lydia. Her name was Lydia. It started in Lydia's house. The Apostle Paul shared the gospel with Lydia. She was a wealthy woman. She opens up her home. It's no longer her castle. It's an embassy of the kingdom of heaven. And people come in and find sanctuary. And they find the preaching and teaching of Paul. And they find out that Jesus is Messiah. And God really does love them. And the church starts to grow. Not just Lydia, but also the ladies from the Riverside prayer meeting. Do you remember that bit? And not only that, the jailer who, who, who had been responsible for Paul's imprisonment. He became a Christian, and so did all of his family. Amazing, amazing. So, 10 years later, the Apostle Paul, he's been doing a lot of traveling, he's been starting a lot of churches, and he winds up under house arrest in the city of Rome, and he's writing back to the church in Philippi. He's writing to Lydia. He's writing to the jailer and his family. He's writing to the ladies, Riverside prayer meeting crowd. He's, he's writing back to them and to encourage them in their faith. Chapter 1 talked about the fact that it doesn't matter that I'm in chains. My imprisonment has turned out for something very good. Because now everyone is hearing about this Jesus I'm in prison for. And they've got to keep me under, uh, under lock and key. They've got to keep changing the guard. And every single guard is finding out about Jesus. They thought they were going to keep me down. The opposite has happened. Paul's boldness became courage for the rest of the church. That's so encouraging. So this letter that he writes to the Philippians, there are only four itty-bitty chapters. 
And right in the middle of the book of Philippians is this poem. In the Greek that it was written in, it would have rhymed, it would have flowed like a poem. They reckon that this might have been one of the first ever church hymns, church praise songs coined of the early church. Isn't that incredible? And this is what the Apostle Paul says about Jesus. Everyone, touch your head and say, have this in mind. Have this in mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of who? Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isn't that incredible? Wow. So this is the center of the brainstorm of the ideas of the letter to Philippians. What Paul is teaching us in this theology about Jesus is this, church. Now listen to this. Genuine spiritual progress is not found in selfish ambition and scrambling for personal recognition. Genuine spiritual progress is found in deep love for God and for people, and that's shown by us serving others. Wow. Genuine spiritual progress is that humble service of others. And as we serve others, we in turn are served and we all are changed from glory to glory. Isn't that good? When I meet with James Screen, Screeno, everyone say hello, Screeno. When I meet with James Screeno and I talk about Jesus, he's encouraged. But I'm even more encouraged when he serves me with what he knows about Jesus. We're both built up in the faith. Are you with me? Wow. This poem highlights that humility is absolutely key to your spiritual progress and mine. Of course it is. Jesus himself said these words. He said, For all of those who exalt themselves will be humbled. (laughs) You self-promoting, self-righteous types, you are going to be humbled. But then he says this, But those who humble themselves will be exalted. Isn't that incredible? Wow. Exalt yourself. The carpet's going to be pulled from under you sooner or later, mate. Humble yourself and the Lord will raise you up. Isn't that incredible? Humility, the key. So the brainstorm from last week, you will see. This is is what we learned from chapter 1, that service is true leadership. We learned that God won't give up on us since he who began a good work in you is what? Faithful to complete it. Loving Jesus more and more means that we can discern what is pure. I just wrote my own little poem. All right. Opposition becomes opportunity for the gospel to abound in you and to others. And then lastly, last week, we said this. Well, the scripture said this. Whatever happens in life, conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy of Christ. Amen? You'll remember that Philippi was a hotbed of political nationalism. It would have been known as a far right-wing society. The people there were were ex-Roman soldiers who were loyal to Rome and loyal to the emperor. You'll remember that only the emperor is to be um, uh, to to serve, to be honoured, to be worshipped in Roman culture, along with the other gods, I suppose. So here you've got a problem. Because you've got a church that is starting who do not recognise the, the, the Caesar, the emperor of Rome, as ultimate authority. The ultimate authority for the, for, for, the, for, for the Christians in Philippi was the king of heaven, not the emperor of Rome. And the minute you start having a higher authority than Rome, you're a rebel. You're a traitor. You're an upstart. You're a turncoat. You're an insurgent. You are revolutionary scum threatening the fabric of our culture. To be a committed follower of Christ in Roman society, to adopt the culture of the kingdom over the culture of Rome was like a spit in the face of the empire. You can imagine the voice of Roman culture saying this to the Christians in Philippi. Look what you have. Look what we fought for. 
Look what your forefathers murdered and raided and pillaged for your benefit. Look at the slaves that we've stolen for your best. We're kings in this life. And you want to follow another king, some day laborer, Jewish rabbi, that you reckon is the son of God, who we nailed to the cross. Are you mad? Are you telling us to be a Roman citizen is not good enough for your heart? You'd rather risk your life as a so-called citizen of heaven? The Apostle Paul actually called Philippi a colony of heaven. Flipping out, Paul. You get this in deep water here. Wow. But I can imagine, maybe you can imagine the heart of the Philippian church responding to the voice of Roman culture with these words. Yes, Rome, your world satisfies my flesh in so many ways. But my spirit was broken until I met the author of life. My stomach was full in this prosperous city, but my heart was hungry for spiritual food that only he can give. I found him to be the bread of life, Rome. My soul was in the dark dark until I met his light, and he is the light of the world, Rome. My Roman citizenship brings certain benefits, but Jesus has opened the door to the benefits and the blessings of God. He is the gateway to real freedom, Rome. Our leaders certainly protect us and fight for the interests of our culture, but they don't compare to the leadership of my good shepherd who cares for everyone on the planet the same as he cares for me. He loves all, regardless of color, creed, or culture. He's the good shepherd. He's more than the emperor could be. I was dead in my sin, but I was baptized in water and spirit. I'm now fully alive, and you can kill me if you like, but I will not really be dead. We have a good life here in Philippi, Rome. But in Jesus, I have life in abundance. He is the true vine. Everything I truly need for my life and in the life to come is supplied by him. It is true, Rome, that this city, this land, this empire gives me shelter for me and my family. But my truest home is found in the everlasting love and provision of our Savior. My body may become dust like yours. But my life will leave a legacy of faith and hope and love and joy. Church, if it wasn't for these Jesus rebel Christians in the city of Philippi, the church of Jesus Christ would never have woven its way through Eastern Europe into Central Europe. Is it, if it wasn't for the gutsy Jesus rebel revolutionaries who refused to let persecution shut the mouth of the gospel and took it to these British isles, oh, we would not be sitting here today. If it wasn't for the same Holy Spirit of all of those forefathers and foremothers, oh my goodness me, we would never have had a church to sit in today and worship the King like we have this afternoon. Can I ask you, where will you pioneer? What community will you pioneer in? How will you pioneer the gospel in your workplace and in your community, in your own family? Doesn't it seem to you that the God of heaven will stop at nothing until the world and all the nations know that he loves them? Wow. Do you know, we're a direct result of the church of Philippi. How cool is that? If we were to trace back our our ancestry, our spiritual ancestry, our gospel family tree, it'd start that moment Paul got off the boat. From Troas to Philippi, he went west instead of east because God asked him to. So let's get into chapter 2, shall we? Is that okay? This guy preaches a long time, doesn't he? The first part of chapter 2, it says this, imitate Christ's humility. Let's read this together. Is that coming up, Does There we are. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, If any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, says Paul, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing, church at Philippi, do nothing, church in Gornal, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ 
Jesus. Isn't that incredible? But it begs the question, what ensures, church, what ensures effective growth, not only as a Jesus follower on our ones, but as a whole church community? The keys are in those scriptures right there. Unity and humility. What ensures your personal spiritual growth and the growth of this church in this community, it is unity and humility. You'll have heard the scripture that says that unity commands the blessing of God on his people. Do you want this church to be blessed? Well, there's something about being unified with a single heart and mind to see the lost found, to see the broken healed, to see people who are far off brought into the family of Christ. That single-mindedness and that unity commands the blessing of God. Who knows where the blessing could stop? Unity amongst a group of people is accelerated and deepened when every single one of us values each other above themselves. And that, when that happens, no one is left out, no one loses out, and all of us are elevated. Do you remember the scripture of Jesus? Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Imagine if that happened en masse. Wow. Wow. Begs the question, if we're to have the same mindset of Christ, what was the mindset of Christ? My brother taught me this a long time ago. The only thing that Jesus describes himself as, his own personality characteristic, the only characteristic he describes of himself is this. I am humble and gentle. Wow. Thank you, sir. We see Jesus as strong, mighty, courageous, stops at nothing. But if you ask Jesus face to face, how would you describe yourself, Lord? He'd say, honestly, humility is the, the person I want to be. Humility is the person I commit to being. What was the mindset of Jesus? Gentleness and humility. What was the mindset of Jesus? Living in obedience to God and living for the service of others. Church, Jesus and Jesus alone is our ultimate model for our Christian faith. Begs the question. So how can I grow in humility? Anyone want a few answers? How can I grow in humility? Number one, recognize that Jesus is king and you are not. <laughs> Number one, recognize that Jesus is king and we are not. I was chatting to my barber. <laughs> You've heard about this before, right? I was chatting to my barber and we were having this great conversation. And we ended up talking about the fact that if he was to become a Christian, it would mean that he'd have to surrender being CEO of his own life. And that's scary. Because his whole life he was saying, I, I've made all my decisions. I, I go where I want to go. I pursue my dreams. But if I suddenly believe in a God, I've got to consider a higher power. And in my own life, I am the highest power. Number one, recognize that Jesus is king and you are not. <laughs> How can I grow in humility? Embrace the truth that God's ways are actually higher than our ways. Number three, take on board constructive correction from people who love Jesus and love you. Number four, grow in patience. You don't need to react off the cuff at every turn. Listen more than you speak. The book of James tells us, listen more than you speak. Some people say, there's a reason you've got two ears and one mouth, yeah. <laughs> listen more than you speak. So that when you do speak, it's far more helpful. Does that make sense? There's a humility that has to happen in order to listen more than we speak. Be kind, church. You want to grow in humility? Just be kind. <laughs> Refuse to be jealous of what others have and cultivate a thankfulness for what you do have. That doesn't half make you, uh, that doesn't half humble you. We've got some really, really wonderful friends of ours called Tony and Lena. And Tony and Lena have had about three or four houses in the time that we've had our one house on Summer Lane, right? And every time they get a new house, it's bigger and better and most, you've never seen something so decorated in your life. It's gorgeous. Jealousy kicks in, and we go back to our mid-terrace council house, ex-council house on Summer Lane, and I sit there fed up, and I'm like, oh, it's not fair. 
I'm jealous. What is it, Lord? What's going on? But you know, I have had to humble myself. I have had to humble myself and literally spend time counting the bricks in my house and being thankful for every single brick, every single bit of mud that gives me shelter. God, thank you for my home. Thank you for my home. Thank you for my home. You want to grow into humility? Practice elevating others before you elevate yourself. Practice elevating others before you elevate yourself. Let me give you an example. The other week, someone said to me, Pete, you should write a book. And I said, I'd love to write a book. I don't know what I'd write about. And someone says, why don't you write a book about starting a church without losing your mind? I said, that's a good title. But then I said, I could not honestly write that book and put my name at the bottom of it because the truth of the matter is, it has been a real team effort, right, church? Hasn't it? It's been a team effort. And I'm not just talking about the core team. I'm talking about you team. This is a team effort. We all have a book to write. (laughs) Maybe one day we'll get to tell our story, what do you reckon? Refuse to be jealous of others. Elevate others more than promoting yourself. Let selflessness be over, uh, let selflessness overtake selfishness. Respond peacefully to situations instead of anger. Don't hold things against others like you've never done anything wrong. Walk away from evil and do what is truly good. Do you know what the scriptures say? The scriptures say that God gives grace, his favor, to the humble, but he opposes the proud. The number one key to your spiritual progress in your faith journey is this, humility. Humility is not doing yourself down. Humility is letting God rise up in you. The scriptures carry on. They say this. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. You enjoying this? In his letter, he says this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your your faith with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. That sounds good, doesn't it? Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine like stars among them as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's break it down. What's he saying? Here's a question. How should we live out our faith? With authenticity. With integrity. Did you hear that? What does that mean? It means be the real deal. Don't fake it. Just follow Jesus. Living for Jesus. Live for him whether somebody is watching or not. That's real integrity. Doing the right thing when nobody else can see you doing it. Whether it's in public or in private, follow Jesus. Whether it's in front of Christian leaders or non-Christian friends, follow Jesus. Whether you're with Christian friends and family or not, church, what are we going to do? We're going to Follow Jesus. What's Paul saying? He says, church at Philippi, you are doing so well. Oh, 10 years in the making. This church is rocking and rolling. You are so great. I'm so impressed with you. But can you keep living authentic faith? Don't fake it any time of day or night. Be real and raw and follow Jesus. What should we do with our salvation? The apostle Paul says, he says, we should work it out. Work it out. (laughs) Three or four months ago, as you know, because I'm ever so proud of myself, I started going to the gym. Here it is again. Yeah, did I tell you? I started going to the gym. Now, oh, I'll tell you my, no, no, no. I've got a new personal best, Dan. I'll tell you in a sec. So three or four months ago, I started uh, to work out. Not Jack Civil workout. Pete Wright workout. (laughs) Yeah, baked beans. 
and good fee cholesterol. Finish him off after. So here's the deal. March 2021, I slipped a disc. I'm going to tell you the true story. It wasn't doing anything impressive at all. Do you remember that long hair I had? I was sat on the edge of the bed, drying my mane, right? I got up awkward, and I slipped a disc. It was very heavy hair. <laughs> true story. I slipped a disc. Whilst trekking in Israel in February 2020, I wrestled with God and got a gammy knee. <laughs> and so I'm 38, not 98, and four months ago, I'm like, I need to sort this out. I need to work it out. See, here's the thing, right? I had my body, but I wasn't working out what I had in order to improve the condition of my body. You with me? Strength grows through exercising what I have. Christian, you already have your salvation. But we are called to work out our salvation to maximize the potential of what we have in Jesus. Strength grows as we work out, living out our faith. Work out. Work out your faith with fear and trembling. So my, uh, my, new, my new personal best on the old squat lift. <laughs> 70 kg, people. I know. 12 reps. How about that? I know. I know. <laughs> I've got twiglets for legs. <laughs> Here's the thing. My gym subscription, it's not cheap, actually. I don't like paying it at all. Who does? My gym subscription is paid out each month in advance of the experience of working out. If I don't turn up, I am literally wasting what has been paid for for my benefit. If I do turn up, I benefit. My kids benefit from a healthier dad. My wife benefits from a healthier husband. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Here's the thing. Our salvation has been paid for in advance. Hello? By Jesus on the cross. To not put our salvation into practice means we are wasting what has been paid for. The world is waiting for you and for me to turn up with the good news. When we turn up and work out our Christianity, we benefit. Our families benefit and the world around us benefits. So church, the question was, what should we do with our salvation? It is work it out with fear and trembling. It's going to be scary sometimes. There's been some trembling with these twiglet legs, I can tell you. In our faith journey... There will be times of fear. There will be times where we are, we are convicted by the written word of God and we suddenly face with the culture of the kingdom is opposite to the culture of the world that I've been operating in. And I am scared, God, because if I go your way, I may face persecution in the workplace. I may face ridicule amongst my friendship group. But the Bible says, nonetheless, work it out. Take brave steps of obedience to the word of God. Amen? How are we doing? Falling asleep yet? We'll have half the size of the congregation again next week. Third question from this little bit of scripture. How do we shine like stars in a warped and crooked generation? Paul tells us, hold tight to Jesus. How do we shine? By holding tight to Jesus. Of course, that's the way. He is the light of the world. And as we hold tight to him, we are the light of the world. How do we do that? We decide each day to follow his example of love, sacrifice, and humility. Church, do you know that grumbling and, and, and disputing in the church is like a dimmer switch on us? Did you know that? Now, I am so grateful to be in a church where I don't think I've ever heard grumbling or disunity amongst us. If you were there in the early days, we used to say almost every week from the platform, well, the front of the pub, if you're a gossip, thank you for visiting, but this is not your church. Does anyone remember that? Grumbling and disputing in the church dims the light of Christ in us and our ability to shine for Jesus in our community. That doesn't mean you don't challenge when things aren't right, but it does mean that we don't leave it as a dispute. We work it out. A heart united with Christ, a whole bunch of hearts united together in Christ, causes God's people to shine like stars in their community. In ancient times, what were the stars used for? There was no sat-nav. 
what they, 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 they used the stars to guide sailors out at sea, would use the stars to guide them to their destination. What if you are meant to shine like a star to guide people to the destination of friendship with God? And if we are dim, that ain't going to happen. But if we refuse to grumble, if we refuse to allow ourselves to get disappointed, if we can just stand firm and hold tight to the Word of God and hold tight to one another, maybe, just maybe, a star will rise in this community. His name is Jesus. Come on now. You're called to shine like a star in your generation. The world is desperate for light. Last part of the scripture. Let's do it. Let's do it. Coming into land. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you so that I too may be cheered uh, by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know, Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself might come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death in fact, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am, more, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing Epaphroditus again, and that I might, I might be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and what? Honour such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. What an incredible thing. These two men, I love that Paul is putting into practice the Jesus ethic of promoting others over yourself. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, I am Paul. I am the great apostle. Yeah, I am pretty awesome. But guys, oh man, Timothy and Epaphroditus, you want to see these lads. Oh my goodness. There is no one I know more committed to your welfare than Timothy. He's an absolute legend. He's wonderful. Oh man. And Epaphroditus, did you know that his mom called him lovely? Epaphroditus means lovely in Greek. Maybe this was his real name. Maybe it was Paul's nickname. Whoever this guy was, he was flipping lovely. Epaphroditus was great. He was lovely. And Epaphroditus and Timothy, they kind of reflect Jesus. Timothy was so concerned about the welfare of others. Epaphroditus risked his life for the sake of the gospel. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Honour such men and honour such women. I honour Pastor John Rowe this afternoon. He's a father in this house, isn't he? Love that guy. I honour him because at the time spring started, he was winding up businesses and about to retire nice and early. But then God called him and said, I want you to go west instead of east, John. I want you to start a church. I want you to be a pastor. Flip your neck, Lord. (laughs) I'll do it, but I'm not going to enjoy it, he said. (laughs) I want to honor Pastor John Rowe and Carol this afternoon. You have no idea how much these guys do voluntarily behind the scenes because of their love for Christ and their love for you. Wow. I could go down each member of the core team. I could, I could talk about Ellie. I could honour Ellie so much this morning. I know Ellie's story and I'm so flipping proud of you, Ellie. We honour you, El. Just looking around this church, I honour Jack Civil. Jack Civil started a TikTok and an Instagram page to inspire young bodybuilders to, to do it the right healthy way. I think that's brilliant. Not only that... Him and Lydia, they get stuck into the youth work. Jack gets stuck in with the football every Tuesday night. My goodness me. They are literally changing the lives of young people in our community. I honor people like them. I honor Paul and Sue Flavel. Four parents in the faith in this community. There are blokes, full-grown blokes, older than me, that still come up to Paul and call him dad because of the way that he loved them and nurtured them and put on um, and youth cl- these guys put on youth clubs to, to bless the young people of Gornal. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. Did you know that? Wow. 
I could go on and on and on. There's not a single person in this room that I could not honor. Every one of you. Not because of your own strength, but because of what you have allowed God to do in your life is worthy of honor. Honor people such as these. As a community, that's growing humility, unity, integrity. What do you reckon? Let's honor one another above ourselves. And in doing so, we are all honored. Wow. You might be sitting in church this afternoon and you're curious about Jesus. You're really curious about what he's got to say. I want to encourage you, if you're not already a follower of Jesus today, can you in humility this afternoon recognize your need of God's love and protection and guidance? I want to encourage you that in the Gospels, nobody became a Christian because somebody did a a response appeal prayer and a bunch of disciples put their hand up. That never happened. Never happened. What did happen was this. Jesus just spoke the truth. He said, follow me. And people followed him. Or they didn't. If you want to follow Jesus, crack on, my friend. Start today. Come to know him. How will you be saved? Anyone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God and you confess with your mouth as such, you are saved. I just want to give you a moment in your heart to confess as such so that you can be saved. If you're a Christian already and you want to give your heart to the Lord all over again, you go for it. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Give my life to you, Lord. Give my life to you, Lord. If you're already a Christian in this place today, you follow Jesus and you love him, can we use today's message as a reminder, like Paul reminded Philippians, integrity, humility, unity. Father, I pray that as a church, as a people that call you Lord, we would grow in integrity of heart. Humility, our disposition. Let unity just be in abundance, Lord. Father, I pray that people would know that we are springs people because of the way we love one another. You said, Lord, let them be one as you and I, you and the Father are one. And so, Father, we thank you again today for oneness. Come move in power, Jesus, for the glory of your name and for the redemption of the souls. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.